Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr, and it's time for the Thursday afternoon, just before Friday, Monday morning podcast. And I'm just checking in on your summertime, bitch. Um, I don't even know if I'm supposed to do one today. I think I interviewed somebody, and that covers today, but whatever. I got like a half hour, you know? Maybe I'll just do one, and I'll just have it, and I'll just save this. Like, maybe this will come out in the fall, and then you guys can all be like, Oh, it's not the summer. You fucking bald red cunt. Yeah, it's fucking, it's autumn. Is it? It all feels like summer to me. That's my new novel on global warming. (laughs) Uh, It's going to be funny when global warming just keeps going and then people sing those, those, what's that Sinatra song? It was a very good year. It was something and something. Wasn't there some song about the autumn of my years? Everyone's going to be like, oh my God, what's that? There's only one season. It's fucking summer. Um, it's hot and a little less hot. That's basically what happened. Um, I'm in a great fucking mood. Even though I got into a nice back and forth with the lovely Nia, the love of my life. You know? It's an honor to be with her. <laughs> It was one of those fights, you know, you have where like, you know, okay, you're married, you have kids and the, the, your, your partner just makes a decision about the kids and you're like, wait, what the fuck? And then like, well, it's a big, big deal, you know? And then, and then what, I don't know. You know, what was funny was I started to get mad, but then I'm like, no, I don't want to yell. So then I shut down then she goes, let's discuss it. I go, I'm not discussing it right now. I need to process it first. And then that made her pissed. And she just went off on me. <laughs> she goes, and then she came back around. And she's like, you sit there and tell me you're going to sit there and process it like you're some fucking Buddha. <laughs> uh, I hate how funny that was. It was the middle of a fight. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's fucking hilarious. Um, whatever, but I was still right. You know what I mean? But you, you know how it is. You know how it is. Just because you're right still means you're wrong. That's how it works when you're the husband. Uh, but other than that, the home light's great, man. It's fucking great. I was hanging with somebody the other night and they said to me, hey, did you see that Wimbledon final? Which was a big part of my childhood. Staying inside, avoiding the sun so my fucking skin wouldn't get like a third degree burn. And I used to love breakfast at Wimbledon with Dick Enberg. And I guess this year was incredible. And that has to be posted somewhere. You know? Is there the original version or is is it five hours of that song? Oh no. Oh no, no, no. Like every fucking Instagram video. I guess it kind of became a genre of Instagram and then everybody was like, oh, good. I, I, if I hear this song like a lab rat, I know something bad is about to happen. And then somewhere along the line, the rat gets sick of hearing that fucking song. Is that what it is? Or the rats viewing the rat? Oh, Bill. This is what happens when, you, when you're doing a podcast and you don't even think you need to do one. The, you know what it is right now, people? It's not that I'm not funny right now. It's just that the effort isn't there. You know, kind of the way your wife washes dishes. You know, she's an adult. She could do it the right way if she wanted to. She sort of just, you know, and then you fucking grab the bowl and you got to, I mean, it looks clean to the naked eye, to someone that actually needs trifocals but hasn't gotten around to getting them. The plate looks clean, but then you go to grab it and you feel the film of whatever the fuck was eaten on it the night before. And you just, you, you know, you curse under your breath. And then there's that voice in your head that goes, you know what, Bill, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And then you're downstairs by yourself, you know, wearing your robe, your freckled milk white calves, poking out the bottom, some old slippers you got for free from somebody you used to advertise on your podcast. And somewhere along the line, you made them mad. And you wash that dish. As you wash the dish, you look up, And you catch your reflection in the window and you see the sadness of what your life has become and you quietly cry to yourself. (laughs) 
make a couple of soft cooked eggs, try to lay off the bread. And then she comes downstairs. She sees your eyes are a little puffy and she says, are you all right? You said, oh yeah, you know, I just didn't get some sleep last night. And you push it down. You don't communicate it. And then it just sits in there. It doesn't leave. It sits in there. You know, and just waits for the next holiday. Whatever it is, you know, Christmas, trying to put the lights on the tree. Fucking is the turkey done? Is it not done? Something like that. And then that, that's when that moment, that's when that moment's going to come out. And she's going to be like, where is this coming from? And you're not even going to know because there's going to be so many other of those moments buried right there in that chest. But it's my belief if you cry enough at the sink, you can get some of them out. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Um, oh, Billy Big Day yesterday. I uh, finally did that solo flight up to Santa Barbara. Um, I don't know if I made the radio calls correctly to approach, and then they, they had me, uh, when, I, when I departed, they put me on with departure, and I was just on with them. And after a while, I was just kind of like, uh, can I just go to the comment channel? And they were like, what? And I'm like, yeah, it's... Kind of like, don't feel like I need you guys anymore. I don't know what the radio call is. Uh, terminating a departure or I don't know what the fuck you're supposed to say. But I said it and I just sat there like with, you know, one eye closed, like here it comes. Uh, but the guy was cool. He figured it out. Um, so now here's the deal. I know how to go up to Santa Barbara. I know how to, uh, I know the approach, the approach to the landing pad. I did it with my instructor, and then this week I did it by myself, a.k.a. soloing. And the first thing I did was, you know, Google places to get coffee and fucking, you know, fun places to take my wife who doesn't value my opinion. <laughs> now, here's the deal. Whenever I, I make fun of my wife to this level, you know that she's going she's gonna to have to come on and give you the rebuttal. Um, you know. Whatever. What, what, what do you want from me? I'm just a man that flew a helicopter to Santa Barbara and back without hurting himself. You know, I did, I did an episode of the Howie Mandel podcast. And uh, he brought up that stuff. And I, I don't like talking to people who aren't pilots because all they do is talk about dying. <laughs> and I was actually out there. I'm going to text him and tell him this. I actually had to block out his voice as I was doing pre-flight. Um, and then I went up and I had a great time. And it was exactly what I wanted. I got out of uh, the LA basin, so there was like nobody up there. And when I got out to the coast, there was this marine layer all the way out over the water. And it got about 100 feet into the, over the land and just disappeared. Because as you know from your, 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 your ground studies, um, water has a way more consistent temperature. It takes a lot longer for it to heat up and to cool down, where land is like, is like a woman. You don't know what it's going to do. Um, oh, my God, she would kill me if I said that. She'd be like, I'm the water, you're the land, you bald psycho. And she'd probably be right. But whatever, land heats up and cools off uh, very quickly. So it was already like noontime. So the, the ground was, the temperature was much higher. So what happens, don't you see, is the clouds come over and those air molecules get heated up by the air rising off of the land. The water molecules expand. And at that point, you know, when, you, uh, when the water molecules become saturated, that is the dew point, which is the point at which moisture becomes visible, a.k.a. a cloud. All right, I'm going to shut up here. It basically heats it up. That's what they mean by burning it off. Um, so I was able to go up the coast and I had clouds that were, I was above, uh, to the left of me, I had the ground below me. And then on the right, I had mountains and I was just flying right up that corridor. It was fucking gorgeous. And then when you get to Carpentaria, that's when you call approach You're 20 miles out. And uh, for whatever reason, Santa Barbara likes you to be on with approach. So that's what I did. I got on with them. And they basically, at that point, they're also watching for other traffic. And then they hand you off to the tower. And uh, it's a little tricky coming in there the first time. You go up the 101, don't you see? And then 
once you see, there's this little, I don't know, this little hanger thing. When you see it, the helipads are on the other side, and the altitude I'm flying at, you can't see them. So I'm always, like, looking for them. I'm like, I know they're not that far. And then once I get a little, you know, just a little bit to the left of that, I'm like, oh, my God, there they are. I'm going to do it after all these years of being intimidated. So that was a big deal for me. That was a big deal for me. God damn it, it happened. And guess what I have right now? I have free time. I'm off until the end of July. Um, knocked out those four weekends in a row. And as hard as that was with the kids, um, now I have all this time off with them. And all I'm doing is we've just basically been swimming. And uh, both my son and my daughter, my daughter can swim now, but like she's just, uh, just improving the skill. And my son, by watching her, just keeps getting better and better and better. And he is absolutely, absolutely fearless, which is fun from some things and then other things, it, you know, scares you. And uh, he's repeating everything. So I have to stop cursing because he said the F word the other day. He said, God damn. And my daughter had one of her friends over and we have this little trampoline that has like a handle on it that you hold on to. And her friend like sat on it and then did like a backwards spin around like super fast, like she knew how to do it, but I didn't know that. So as her head was whipping around, I was like, oh, I literally went, I was holding my son and went, Jesus Christ. And my son looks at me and he just goes, gee, Christ. (laughs) (laughs) So there's that. So I got that going for me. So I've, I've, uh, I've been practicing in the car not cursing. And I, it just blows my mind how I, I just, the F word just, when I really pay attention to it, it's the third word every time or the second. It's either what the or the. The fuck is this guy doing? The fuck is going on here? It's just, it's just, or I go, oh, you stupid fucking There you go, you fucking... That's what it is. Always. Always goes like that. So I I always say the F word now, but then I stop and I go, silly person. I go, what the fucking you? You're a silly person. That's what you are. You're just, you're silly. You're wacky. You know? You changed lanes, but you didn't get your whole car in there. You're, You're, you know? So it's still blocking the lane and you're causing a traffic jam and people are beeping at you and you don't understand why to the point you're giving them the finger as if you're the victim. You're just a silly person. That's going to be my new code for cunt, which is just so much more sad. Cunt. It's, you know, I feel like he just gets it out of there. It's like nice fucking blunt force. Silly. But maybe I can use silly as like a salve for my emotions, as Frank Santarelli would say, S-A-L-V-E, salve. Um, anyway, I'm going to try to go online and I'm going to try to find some of these goddamn... Um, what am I even talking about? I'm going to try to find the, uh, the, 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 the Wimbledon thing. Wimbledon. Is it Wimbledon? Not Wimbledon. Breakfast at Wimbledon, I said my whole life growing up. It was breakfast at Wimbledon. All right, I'm going to look something up here. We're going to look up the last few albums that Mr. Burr has downloaded. All right, because I'm enjoying this music. I obviously obviously got the uh, new Queen of the Stone Age album. Had to do that. Um, Did not disappoint, as always, as always. You know what I love about their albums? I always feel like in the beginning, I like a couple of songs and I don't quite get the rest of it. And then the next time I listen to it, I get it even more. And then by like the third listening, I'm like, this fucking album is incredible. So that's how dumb I am. (laughs) So now I have it on in my car on like a loop. And, uh, you know, I always do ACDC on the elliptical, but in the car right now, that's, that's where I am right now. Um, 
And then I also, I downloaded uh, this Cannonball Adderley album. It's called Something Else. Cannonball Adder Adderley, Miles Davis, Hank Jones, Sam Jones, and Art Blakey. It was 1958, and I'm enjoying that. I downloaded another song called Meet the Woo. No, yeah, Meet the Woo. Uh, this rapper Pop Smoke, who I guess, unfortunately, in a home invasion, got killed, so rest in peace. But I really like whatever, uh, his, the sound of his voice and the tracks that he raps over are amazing. So look at that, huh? If you've noticed, now most people would say that that is a very eclectic mix of music. But I know myself well, that means like, oh, Bill was on the road and his brain is all over the place. Just like he is. He's here, he's there, he's checking in, he's checking out, he's on a plane, he's getting off a plane. I'm gonna listen to some jazz, I'm gonna listen to Queen Star, I'm gonna listen to some hip hop. Oh, fucking lunatic. And then I come home and new rules are in place and I'm like, what the fuck? And then I get to some stupid tiff with my wife who I don't wanna fight with because I love her. And now here I sit, alone in my room, you know? I'm not crying at the sink, okay? We had that moment this morning. <laughs> that might be the name of my next stand-up special. Bill Burr, crying at the sink. <laughs> I used to do a bit about that. Of course, it was misogynistic. Well, it wasn't. It was actually talking about how men used to ha prevent women from... Uh, reaching their dreams and had something to do with them. There's always a window to look out while you're washing the dishes. And that was for back in the day when women weren't allowed to leave the house. That's what it was. So they would just look out the window and just, you know, dream. Oh, someday maybe I can walk past that last tree that I can see as they wash the dish, something like that. Something ignorant. Um... <clears throat> I had a great time the other night. I went down to the uh, comedy store and uh, I did some time down there. I haven't done that in a uh, in quite some time. Just, oh, it feels like it anyway. I really, uh, I really miss that place. You know, there's something about it too. And something too, like, or maybe an off night when it's not like a... Uh, Friday or Saturday and people don't have expectations. There's sort of a more relaxed vibe down there. And I always feel like, kind of feel like the history of it and stuff. Um, but anyway, I went down there and I did Adam Ray's show. He does this show where he goes in full makeup and he's dressed as uh, Dr. Phil. And he just comes out like, um, you okay, on today's show, um, we actually have a comedian and he's going to come out here and entertain you folks. And afterwards, we're going to talk, we're going to talk to him. So I go out and do my shit and uh, I act like an extra idiot, you know. So when he comes out, he can psychoanalyze me, analyze me, you know. So he came out, um, okay, Bill, um, there was a lot of anger in that. <laughs> <coughs> So I think they're going to be posting some clips of that. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> if you're wondering what my next flight is going to be, um, I believe my next flight, getting out of the L.A. Basin, because I've just flown it so much. And then it's also, you know, there's a, you're always constantly, I feel, approaching another airport, and I got to talk to them instead of being able to cruise around a little bit. And what was funny when I was coming back, from Santa Barbara, you go through, uh, I follow the 118, you know, past Ronald Reagan, Santa Susana Pass. And right as I come over there, we got the ATIS on for Burbank. And I'm switching over to, uh, to Van Nuys to see if I, you know, if it's cool to cross midfield or whatever, right? So the second I get on with them, they go, you know, helicopter, blah, 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 blah. Turn to heading 040. There's a police chase. There's four helicopters headed towards you. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'm back in the L.A. Basin. Here we go. It was fucking cool. So, I mean, they were like, you know, two miles away. It wasn't like they were bearing down on me. Just for people who don't fly before you get all freaked out. So I turned to that heading and I flew it. And uh, he got back on like within a minute, said, you know, they're now headed south, which usually happens in a car chase. It's not like the person's driving the same way. 
They serpentined, and that's a big mistake OJ made, or at least his driver did. They got on the 405 and they stayed on it. What you want to do is zigzag through the neighborhood, you know? Make it entertaining for the pilots. You're still not going to get away, but it's, it's entertaining for, for the viewers, we'll say. So um, anyway, and then I ended up getting back on course, and I looked off because I have, with my avionics, I can see where the other helicopters and planes are. They have the transponder on, which, of course, they did. And I just saw this cluster of four helicopters. It was kind of cool. Like, one lays back. One's out front, and it looked like there was kind of two on either side. Um, and I was kind of looking at it like, that almost looks like a hockey team when, they're, when the other team's on the power play. You know, and if you, uh, you know, it's five on four, and you, you got the box. Because I was thinking, like, if he did a U-turn and went the other way, the guy in the back is now the lead. Do they stay in, like, that formation? If there's any helicopter pilot, uh, police helicopter pilots out there and you want to write in, I would love to know what that's like. Um, anyways, Sani Inez, that's the field that I'm going to go to next. Um, and then I'm going to do Santa Maria after that. And eventually I'm going to work my way up to Paso Robles. Um, and kind of basically understand how to do the, all of this wine country stuff. What the fuck is Paso Robles? I'm sorry, I'm looking on the map here. Ooh, a, oh, there it is. Is that it? There it is. That's not so bad. Um, <clears throat> I just got to find the right way to go up there. I just don't like being like flying over mountains the whole fucking time because God forbid you had to set it down or whatever. Then what do I, I got to walk out and like, you know, deal with fucking mountain lions and bears and shit like that. I don't, I don't need that. I don't need that in my fucking life. I like to follow a road up, you know, land near a 7-Eleven. Great horny toads, what happened to you, buddy? Are you the feds? I ain't growing weed. No, no, no. Just had a little problem. Had to set her down. <laughs> That's what I get nervous about when I'm on the other side of the San Gabriel Mountains when I fly out there. What's great about flying out there is you have a place to put it if you had a problem. But then the problem is, is whose yard do you land in? What are they on? And, you know, you land in a helicopter. Someone's on meth. They, they think it's the cops. And then what happens, right? That's why I try to stay near the highways. The highways are always like the, uh, seems like the, uh, the DMZ, right? It's probably not a good expression to use, the dead man zone. Um, anywho, that's it. I'm going to play little drums. I'm going to make up with my wife when she gets home. Um, there's only one way to do that. There's only one way to make up with your wife, Okay. You have to give up on calling her on what she did wrong. You just have to apologize for whatever it is you did. And then hopefully you're married to an adult. And at that point, she'll apologize for what she did. She still doesn't mean it, you know. It doesn't mean shit to her. But, you know, just that the fact that you can even get her to give you a fake apology I like to think is is a uh, is a minor victory. You know what I mean? It's sort of that Don Beebe play in the Super Bowl, where yes, you lost by fifty, but he didn't quit on that play, and yes, he did slap the ball away, so they didn't lose by fifty-seven. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> all right, I guess at this point, what I would do is I would read some sort of advertising if that is, in fact, what I had um, had to do. Oh, Billy Boy's been fucking reading. I read two books and a script in the last couple of weeks, and I'm very proud of myself. You know, a lot of people say I'm stupid. A lot of people are right. Um, I actually, I have so many books that I started, and then my ADD kicks in. I got this book that Jim Carrey wrote that is fucking amazing. Jim Carrey and Dana Vachon, Memoirs and Misinformation. <clears throat> I'm halfway through it. I put stuck an envelope in here. DMV per- Expedite p- Processing. Well, I'm sure that's not important. That's my bookmark. I did that the other week with a, like a gig check. I couldn't find my gig check, and I realized that I tend to use important documents as bookmarkers. God damn it. 
You know, they say your nose and your ears don't stop growing your entire life. And I agree with that because I never used to have a problem with getting water in my ears. And all of a sudden it does. So I think my ear canal has gotten bigger on the right side. It's been driving me fucking nuts. But you know what I always think? <clears throat> I always think whenever I have a problem, I think, you know what? As bad as this is, because now my ears ringing with the tinnitus and it also feels like it's underwater. <clears throat> What I always do when something like that bothers me like that, I just think like, well, you know what? As bad as that is, some guy in the middle of nowhere took out an AR-15 and shot at a tractor that he put dynamite in, and he he was too close to it, and he blew his leg off. I blew my leg off. Remember that classic video? Blew my leg off. I blew my leg off. One of the most fascinating things I've ever heard. He didn't scream in pain. He wasn't going, oh, my God, what did I do? He just went, I blew my leg off. I blew my leg off. I think when you really fuck up, you're actually calm. I saw a guy trying to take a hook out of this little shark's mouth, and it bit down, and it bit his pinky finger off and went into the water with the pinky. And the guy just goes, ah, it bit my goddamn pinky off. It bit my goddamn pinky off. It took my finger, Charlie. It took my pinky. You think they would do that, but they don't. Another one, the fucking the trick shooter. I was just talking to a buddy of mine at dinner the other night. Those guys that do the fucking trick shooting and they spin the gun around. That old cowboy. I just shot myself in the goddamn leg. Son of a... I, I don't believe it. I just shot myself... In the goddamn leg. Do you think that guy way back in the day, remember that chick cut his dick off? <clears throat> he was fucking around on her, so she cut his dick off and then threw it in the garbage. Just, I can't remember what the fuck happened, right? And uh, I wonder if he did that. She just cut my goddamn dick off. Son of a bitch. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So, well, I don't know what I don't know what I don't know what to tell you. My fucking ears ringing. It's 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 feels like it's it's fucking underwater, and uh, I got a frog in my throat. But you know what? I still went I still went to the gym, and like a good soccer mom, I got on that goddamn elliptical. I put on an ACDC album. That's what I do. I don't do time. I do an album. I went on today was Dirty Deeds. All right. Honorable mention, underrated ACDC song, Love at First Feel. I'm telling you. And they should use that song Rocker in a Pixar movie. If there's ever some little cute things that they make, Minions or whatever, and they want to start a band or something like that, they should do their version of it. They should do a cover of that song in the Minion voice. ACDC would make some money, the kids would laugh, and they would get another generation of fans. You know, a buddy of mine sent me a clip of um, that Live in Paris show that they did right before Bon Scott died. And that is our, I, I would put that concert up against any fucking rock concert that has ever, ever been done. The sound, the energy, the sheer fucking power of that band. Um... And just one of the tightest bands that ever that ever fucking did it. It's amazing. If you get a chance, check it out. Anyway, that is the Thursday afternoon just before Friday, Monday morning podcast. Um, have a great weekend, you silly cunts. See that? I almost, you know, I was going to say you silly people, but then I realized the English say silly cunt. Well, you're in charge of security, you silly cunt. Did you see Peter Grant's daughter is selling her shares of Led Zeppelin 10%? That's got to be $100 million. To own 10% of Led Zeppelin has to be like, that has to be a billion dollar purchase to get, if you were to get all of it. Um, I was sitting there like thinking like, how many people would I have to get to pool together to see if we could buy that 10%, you know? Just, you know, I don't know.
what does that mean? Do you, do you get anything from it? Do you get like a, like a, you're the biggest fan patch or some shit? Some rich cunt's going to buy it. I'm going to say that that's going to go for $175 million. That's what I'm saying. All right, there. You heard it first. Um, I do not look good in a tank top. No matter how much I work out, I am just so fucking pasty. You know, I wear a tank top. I look like I should be shuffling down the hall, like holding onto an IV. Oh, I fucking hate myself. All right. Love you guys. Have a great weekend. Bye. Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr, and it's the Monday Morning Podcast for Monday, July 27th, 2015. How's it going? How are you? Dude, July's almost over. Where's the fucking summer going, kid? Dude, you know what I want to get? I want to get some of that fucking, uh, who's that politician on the beer there? Sam Adams, summer ale kid, right? I drink the summer ale in the summer, right? In the fall, I drink the one with the fucking cherries in it. And then the rest of the time, I just drink their regular lager. What's up, everybody? So, old Billy Red Cakes, old Red Velvet here. He's been trying to lose weight. ba da ba Let's go, freckles, you fucking douche, go get a tan, no one wants to see your fucking pasty legs at the beach. Um, <laughs> so, last week I was supposed to be 180 pounds, but I was not in the facility of a, of, a, of a scale. And by the way, somebody gave me shit, like, dude, what kind of fucking respectable hotel doesn't have a scale? Doesn't have a scale where you like that that comes standards where you where you stay? Where are you staying at, huh? You staying at the old Illuminati Inn? Huh? Does some broad come in wearing some fucking weird mask? All fucking naked? One of those fucking perfectly shaped broads like you see in the movie by the guy who did the eyes wide shut? It's one of the Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick has some of the hottest broads ever in the history of film in his movies. Ever. Ever. You know, it's just a shame horrible shit happens to him. But, you, you know, in the midst of the horror, you're like, God damn, that's a beautiful woman. And I think that really speaks to the beauty of a woman, that something horrible could be happening when you're like, wow, she looks like a fucking statue with a muff. All right. <laughs> they never have the muffs in statues. Have you noticed that? It's a little difficult with the concrete. What are you going to do? Huh? Have somebody with long fingernails kind of come up while the concrete's still wet and just kind of ah, do one of those right in the old crotch area. How does that go, Bill? That goes, ah. that's how you do it. That's how you make it. You know, I took a sculpture class just like old Adolf Hitler did, didn't he? Or you take a painting class. I don't know what he did. It just always makes me kind of smile thinking there was a point in his life where he was just thinking he was going to be an artist, you know, sitting there with an easel. You know what I mean? Paint some ducks. You know, by a pond. And who knows? Maybe uh, somebody Jewish walked by and sneezed and scared the ducks. And it just he just fucking snapped. And just sent him, just sent him down a whole other road. You know? Has anybody explored that theory? Um, that was offensive to ducks and Jewish people. Oh, this blog is going to be easy. Um, so, <laughs> so anyways, I'm sitting here in my office. Um... Fucking hot as hell. I got to close the windows on the counter. I swear a lot. You know what I mean? And I wouldn't want to offend the people next door. God knows I could reach out and touch their fucking house. Reach out. Reach out and touch my house. So fucking stupid. This is such a fucking stupid city. I I live in a a city, yet I live in a house in a city. You know? And I have a yard. But I I don't. You know what I mean? Got to have the drapes closed. People just walking by looking at you and shit. Um, so anyways, I'm back here. So anyways, I was supposed to get down to 180 fucking pounds. I couldn't weigh myself last week. I was at the Jess for Last Festival. The booze was flowing. All right? And I stayed away. What's that fucking grunge song? I stay away. It was Allison Chains. Off a jar of flies, I believe. Wow, that takes me back in the day. Hey, let's let's go down this ADD fucking stream before I get to my official weigh-in. Um, I used to listen to that fucking 
that fucking cassette tape when I would be driving in my 83 Ford Ranger with the re- rebuilt Ford cylinder that the broad I worked with told me that was a dumb move. She was all excited that I was going to buy a new car. And my brother told me, don't do that. Then you chained your day job. You don't want to fucking do that. So I didn't. I rebuilt it. I didn't rebuild it. I had somebody else put a brand new one. That's what happened. The other one fucking burned up. So I fucking had a brand new one put in. Cost me 1500 bucks at the time. This is the early 90s. I still remember that woman when I went to work. She's like, where's the new car? I said, oh, you know what? I decided to put a new engine in my truck instead. And she just like made this what the fuck look and just wrinkled her nose and went, that was stupid. Um, <laughs> was it? Was it stupid? Maybe I don't want to stay there wearing this smock for the rest of my life. All right. With your fucking uh, whatever you got there. What was it? The Nissan Power Ranger? What did they make in the early 80s that everybody loved? The Maxima. You get it? You're taking it to the max, to your mom. Maxima. Maxima. Ma, I can't afford the payments. Can you take over? I got fired for smoking weed on the do- All right, I did a little blow. Okay, I stayed out all fuck. Oh, you know what? I, I will move out. Um, that's what you hear in Boston when the windows ain't closed. So anyways, uh, what was I saying? So I used to fucking drive that thing. And, um, oh man, those are the fucking days. And I would do fucking Dick Doherty's room up and drink it. I do the high five. This restaurant on top of the only skyscraper in fucking Manchester, New Hampshire, or the other fucking, the other town there. What's the other town? There's two towns in fucking New Hampshire. The rest of it is fucking beautiful woods, streams, and uh, probably a lot of people doing heroin. Heroin's back in a big way. Hey, I'll tell you, this kid hasn't been on stage in a while. Let's bring him up. Um, it's the other one. Nashua. See, the, I think it was in Manchester. I used to do the high five. I used to do Bob Marley's fucking room on Old Orchard Beach. And I used to fucking listen to that cassette tape over and over and over again. The whole way down. In fact, I remember coming back down, down 128, heading back down to my house. I had to work the next fucking day. Driving like 80 miles an hour, and all of a sudden, I got a fucking flat tire, and um, pulling over on the side of the fucking road, one of the scariest things you can do on the highway, pulled over, and uh, all they had was that, you know, that little fucking, you know, that awful poor excuse for a fucking tire iron, you know, it's just like the little, uh, when you, you could fit it right up your sleeve, little L-shaped fucking thing, and I knew I didn't have enough leverage, because I'd been there before, so I always had a section of pipe behind my seat. And, uh, dude, I changed that thing. Like, I, I don't think a pit crew, well, actually a pit crew could do it, but uh, for, for one person, I changed that fucking tire so goddamn fast sitting on the side of the road. I had my spare in the back of the truck, you know, that section of pipe, fucking four lugs. I used to have that down. I had so many fucking flats over the years, and that thing was such a piece of shit, that truck, that I, I knew the whole fucking routine, you know? Take out your spare tire, stick it under the car, you know, a little bit in case it comes slamming fucking down and hits the tire and not your foot, right? Loosen all the fucking lugs with your section of pipe on your little fucking L-shaped thing before you raise the fucking truck. Then you jack it up, all right? You take the fucker off, you stick, you know, I used to put the lugs right in a row. There was no cell phones, I didn't have a flashlight, I had fucking nothing. I'd line them right up in the back of the truck. I used to pray to God that it happened on the right side, like that was a good night. And you stick the fucker back on, you start all four of them, you set the thing back down, and you wabash, 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 and then you're back in the fucking truck. Feeling like a man. Anyways, so what was I talking about? I was talking about how I uh, how much weight I lost. So, um, so I was supposed to be at 180 last week, did not have a scale, because evidently I stay in shitty hotels. And uh, this week I was supposed to be 177. All right? And I fucking worked out. The whole time I was up in Montreal, I ran the stairs, Royal Park, whatever the fuck they call it. Um, ran those almost every day or as long as I could. I took one day off, and uh, but that day I played hockey and absolutely fucking embarrassed myself. Oh, my God. I hadn't played hockey in like four months, and I already sucked. And I went out there and just for laughs knew this guy who used to play for the fucking Canadians. And he looks like a fucking movie star. Come on, Habs fans. You know who he is. Huh? First number four, second number four, later traded to the Devils. 
He's got this fucking sick ass like little mini rink. So anyways, we Stefan Richet. So we fucking show up and I'm going, oh, my God, this fucking Stefan Richet. Um, he used to kill us. And um, so we played and like the other team was just a bunch of ringers. And they came out there and like my first shift, I think I was on the ice for like fucking three seconds and they scored. You know, and I'm coming back and immediately everybody knows they already knew I sucked. But now like they now it's like they have like they know how much I suck. Right. And uh, they, they st- the other team scored like fucking three goals within, um, I don't know, maybe a minute. And uh, then all of a sudden we got like two and then blah, blah, blah. Then they were up like eight to five and then dud, and then people, you know. This is basic what happened. They realized that they were way better, and they were nice enough to let us win by one. That's what happened. <laughs> I think we won like 13 to 12. Um, it was a good time. I had zero shots on net. Never fell down, though. I never went down, Ray. They never knocked me down. But I was, I was, uh, I was awful. Ah, oh, man, I should have skated at least once before I went up there. And, um, but whatever. I burned some calories. Uh, but thank you to everybody there at the rink that let us play out there. I had a great, despite the fact that I was fucking horrific, I had a great time. And um, I don't know, hockey players are just fucking funny guys to hang out with anyway. So everybody was busting balls and that type of shit. And, you know, guys coming in the face off. Oh, I'm going up against old freckles, you know, giving me shit. And then they go right around me. And you know what? There was nothing I could do about it. So thanks to everybody hooking it up. And thank you to the other team for letting us win by one or two, whatever you did. It's very nice of you. Very hospitable. So anyways, so now I come back and uh, I stepped on the scale this morning. It's Sunday. I was supposed to be 180 last week and 177 this week. And I got on the scale and my weight was 180 pounds even. So, so I'm three pounds behind what the fuck I wanted to do. However, I was 186.6 when I started this fucking thing. So, what does a quitter do? Huh? What does a quitter do besides take off her horseshoes and walk barefoot back to the fucking hotel room across the casino floor with dirty ass fucking feet? What else does a quitter do? A quitter goes like, well, I, I was supposed to be 177 and I'm 180. Forget it. Fuck that. Last week was a wash for me, all right? I'll consider that a bye week because I was on the road. So next week, I got to get down to 177. Who gives a fuck as long as I reach my goal of getting down to 162 pounds the last time I had abs, all right? This is my last big push. I'm turning 50 in three fucking years. This is my last hope. Nobody has abs in their 50s unless you did heroin in your 20s, and that's a fact, and you can fucking look it up. Look at Keith Richards. Look at the fucking shape that guy's in. Despite his horrific habits. Tremendous shape. You know? All those fucking guys. Anybody who did the fucking smack. The key is, is not to OD and die. You get clean. And I don't know what it is, man. The rest of your fucking life. It's like you just have an orange. And like you're, you're full for fucking 10 hours. I have no idea how they do it. Um... I don't want to start outing people that did heroin. Let's just say if you do hard drugs in general, you know, look at what's his face there from that band, you know, that had the puppets on the cover. You know what I'm talking about. I am skid and bones. I am pointy nose. But a motherfucker makes me cry. Right? He's fucking skinny as shit. He's pushing 60. Um, I'm not advocating doing heroin. I'm just talking about having abs in your 50s. I'm doing it au natural. So no heroin. Um, So anyways, I feel, though, I do feel by tomorrow, Monday, which you listen to now, not to fuck you up, I will be 179. So I'm only like two pounds behind. Um, So what I keep doing is I keep switching up the fucking workout. And uh, Bert fucking Kreischer was nice enough to send me something about grip strength from one of those men's magazines that... um, I can never commit to having a subscription to because it's just the same thing over. Like all those men's health magazines, you know what? They're just like Cosmo. If you really look at the covers, it's the same shit every every fucking ep- episode or whatever you call it, every issue. Cosmo's always some fucking hot fucking airbrush broad, right? There's something else, you know, so-and-so's most in-depth 
uh, fucking interview ever. She's finally found happiness, right, or whatever. And then there's always, you know, either how to get your man, how do you know if your man's fucking around, how to really please your man, how to get your man to please you, one of of those fucking articles. And then on the men's one, right, they always got some guy who's kind of famous, right, who's shredded, airbrushed and all of that shit. And it's always how to get abs in fucking 20 days. Um, the Cirque du Soleil diet or some fuck, some fucking diet. And then, um, oh, some new, new, new fucking arm workout that's going to explode your biceps or some shit. It's all the same fucking crap. You know what you got to do. All right. You fucking eat, you eat well at the beginning of the day. You have your fruits before fucking 12. And then after that, you go veggie. You have your fucking meat that the size of the palm you have. If you're even remotely near that and you're working out, if you're doing half hour of fucking cardio, and you lay off the booze, the ice cream, the chips, the cookies, and all that shit, where is it going to get? The fat's got nowhere to hide. You turn the lights on, the roaches all fucking start scurrying. That's the first time I ever used scurrying in fucking eight, eight years of doing a podcast. You know what you got to do. You don't need those fucking magazines. But every once in a while, you get bored with your workout. You want something new. So Bert Kreischer sent me this thing. I'm going to go back on my, my Twitter history and try and find it. But he sent me this killer fucking um, grip strength workout. And uh, one of, the first thing is you just try to hang from a chin-up bar in the pull-up position for fucking a minute. Three sets of one minute. And um, the key to that is just hang there. What I was doing was I was kind of in like a, like a fucking the first third of a pull-up. So I was burning out. But if you just hang there, it's not that fucking hard. So now I've moved to the next one, which is you, you do it again for a minute, but you're hanging there, holding the bar with one hand, and the other one, you drape some sort of cloth, you know, whatever. If you're in your garage like me, the fucking rag you use to fucking check your oil, which is probably stupid because there's oil on it, but whatever, that helps with the grip strength. And you, that one you hold, you just drape it over, just some sort of face cloth. You drape that over and you hang onto that with one hand, the other hand's on the bar. You try to do it for a minute and then you switch hands. And uh, I've been able to do it for a minute on one side. And then the other side, I did it for about 45 seconds. That's where I'm at on that thing. And then, of course, you're like, well, let me put two up there and see if I can just hang by two fucking rags. And I almost broke both my kneecaps. That's hard as shit for me anyways. You know, so that's where the fuck I'm at. So I'm going to get down to 177 next week by hook or by crook. And... um, I'm hanging in there with the booze. 21 days, no booze. I'm getting to the point of, eh, you know, who gives a fuck? I was kidding. No, I can't wait for September 15th. Sept- no, September 16th is when I can booze. That's when I can, uh, I can booze again. But uh, I got to tell you, um, the hardest place for me to not booze actually is my house. You know why? Because I got the good shit. You know, you go out to a fucking bar. What am I going to do out there? I'm married, so I don't give a shit about the women out there, you know? And then I got to spend 10 times what I'm going to pay at home. And and, and I'm going to drink eat, eat fucking cheap booze, right? Why the fuck would I do that? In fact, all you youngsters out there, I know because you, 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 you know what? You're single. You want to get laid or whatever. But if you really want to go out for a fucking night of drinking, you want something good. It's just like eating at home. It's way cheaper. Pull your fucking money together. All of yous. How many it takes? Go get yourself just a fucking bottle of uh, Johnny Walker Blue. Just get that. You know what I mean? Don't put any ice on it, you cunts. Sip it like a fucking gentleman. I'm telling you. I don't know. That, you, know who the, you, you can't appreciate that in your 20s. If you appreciate that in your 20s, uh, you're, you're, you're a fucking raging alcoholic. If your palate is that sophisticated... Either that or your dad's a banker or some shit, you know, instead of you finishing his morning coffee with some sort of booze so he could numb the fucking lies he was going to tell all day. Oh, Jesus, Bill, could you get more dramatic? I'm sorry. What what do you want from me? How many times I got to tell you guys? I got an hour to fucking fill here. Hour to fucking fill over there. Um, All right. Let's get to some of the reads for this week. Hey, everybody, you're going to get to listen to me read out loud. Um, By the way, um... No, no, uh, no hard feelings with uh, uh, DraftKings. By the way, you know they explain their position to me. They they know that they're gambling. They don't give a fuck, right? But they're just in business with baseball. They're trying to make their money. Why would I be a douche and try to hurt them for making money, right? So they said eventually they'll come back to the podcast and I'll play ball. All right, I'll play ball. 
what do you want from me? You know, I immediately, that's probably because I never talked to the advertisers. That helps, you know, whenever they called to complain. Is he available? No. When is he available? Never. (laughs) I already know what you're going to say. Oh, we didn't like what you said. I was like, I won the first three quarters and I fucked it up in the end. Christ, you lost the game. Um, anyway, so let's, uh, let's move on with the podcast here. A lot of shit happened in the news. The latest person to get in trouble and to be branded a racist. Hulkamania. Hulk Hogan. It's running wild. Um, the Hulkster. Having a conversation. Dropping the N-word. Dropping the fucking N-word. So then his, bro- his, his, uh, his daughter comes to his defense, says he's not a racist. You know, I don't know. Who the fuck? What are you going to do? I mean, you're dropping the N-word. That, that's a rough one. I'll tell you, that's a rough one, you know. But then he's got friends who are African American, yet he's fucking dropping the N-word. You know what I think it really is? I think there's a bunch of different levels to being racist. You know what I mean? It's like me. I play drums, but it's just a fucking hobby. But John Bonham was a fucking drummer. You know what I mean? So, like, the John Bonhams of, of, of racism are, like, in the Klan. They're in, like, those white supremacist groups, you know? They were in the, the fucking, they were with the Nazis. You know what I mean? They are professional fucking racists. This is what they do. This is how they earn a living. You know? Can you earn a living in the Klan? <laughs> Isn't it kind of like a volunteer fire department, but, you, but you're just fucking, you're racist? And you start fires. What is, it's like a drum circle, except you just say hateful shit. What exactly is the Klan? Why would you join the Klan? And then you got other people who are more like, you know, it's like they're not a professional racist, but if they wanted to be, if they wanted to be, they could be the grand dragon in the Klan. They just don't apply themselves. So instead they work at like Home Depot or some shit. Right. They think just as much fucked up shit. And then you got the person who occasionally, you know, like me, goes around, plays drums every once in a while. These guys do the same thing, except they drop the N word every once in a while. I think Hogan's like right around there. You know what I mean? It's like when his daughter's saying he's not a racist. She means like he's not in the Klan. He doesn't have a swastika tattoo. You know what I mean? But he's still playing drums there. You know what I'm saying? Why am I relating drums to fucking being a racist? I don't fucking know. Who knows? He was also, I looked up his age. He's 61 years old. He was born August 11th, 1953. So that means if his parents had him at like what? Like 25. They were born in 1928. So Jesus Christ. I mean, what the fuck were his parents filling his head, head up with, right? His parents lived through the Depression. They was already preaching that there wasn't enough and that black people, now that they were free, were going to take everything from the white man. That paranoia was probably already there. Then they went into the fucking depression. So maybe his parents were extra fucking racist. So he had to crawl out of that hole and him crawling out of that hole was having black friends. But, uh, but you know, he's like, one of those, he has black friends, but he's like, I don't want my daughter to date one. So he's like, you know, I'd say he's like an intermediate racist. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you, brother. Um, what are you going to do? Who, who, who's getting who? You know, you fucking, you put a tape recorder on and, and people still don't know the song. Who, who knows what the fuck? I mean, we would all have to apologize for something. If somebody left a fucking tape recorder on all goddamn day long and you didn't know it was on, Nixon lost the White House doing that shit. You wouldn't be in trouble. Jesus Christ, the fucking shit that I say over the course of a day about fucking broads and all this type of that something, something would come out. You know, or if they read all the texts that you do, joking around with your friends, but you know it's a fucking joke, you know what I mean? I'm not saying you drop the N-word, but come on, somebody would get you. Somebody would get you for something homophobic, right? Something? I don't fucking know. But uh, what? I think it's, it's going to be a good thing. I think the guy hopefully will learn something from it. And he won't do shit like that anymore. Hopefully he'll know that it's wrong. But I really think in moments like that, you got to let somebody be a fucking human being. You got to take into consideration when they were born, what was fed into their fucking heads. 
and give him an opportunity to redeem themselves. Because if he just fuck, he should cancel all his fucking matches and all that shit. What is that going to do? Except drive him more towards anger. That's what I say. Because the other shit's not working. Firing people. You know what I mean? That fucking chef there that had the slave-themed fucking wedding. Do you, do you think she's not thinking, you know? I'm sure she's a little bit better, but did that really help? I don't fucking know. What am I talking about? Who knows? So uh, let's get back to the podcast. So I, oh, here, oh, this is what I wanted to talk about. Here we go. Here we go. So Tom Brady slaying all the ladies. Um, he's, you know, he appealed the four-game suspension. And uh, somebody who was speaking for all the owners said that they were they were all hoping that they would all the other owners I should say were hoping that uh, the NFL would uphold this suspension because what he did was so fucking horrific or allegedly did you know they can't fucking prove it or whatever that's the thing they can't fucking prove he did anything yet there's a four game fucking suspension that these cunts want to be upheld that they want to have upheld and the number one and two people fucking that are on their side, believe it or not, are the Indianapolis Colts and the fucking Baltimore Ravens. And this is such a fucking layup for a joke. The Ravens fucking quote, let me find it here, was that the Patriots have been getting away with murder for years. Why? If you're connected with the Baltimore Ravens, would you ever use the expression getting away with murder? These fucking teams, you know, they're all sitting in glass houses, and I love that they fucking trash the Patriots for whatever the fuck it is they think that we're doing. You know, like they're these holier-than-thou people. You want to talk about getting away with murder? Hey, how about this? At least when one of our players is involved in a murder, the fucker goes to jail. You know, at least we got that on you. The fucking Ravens. Jesus Christ, in your last fucking decade, you had a guy fucking... Fucking f- drop his fiance in an elevator and drag her out. And you guys were fine with the four game suspension because all you give a fuck about is the performance. And then you had a- your other guy there, right? Obstruction of justice in a double fucking homicide. Not only do you look the other fucking way, you let him play in the Super Bowl. He invites his two buddies there who are up on the fucking double homicide charges are sitting there in the game, and you didn't give a fuck, and you're going to talk about airing a ball? Shame on you. Shame on you, Baltimore Ravens. And I don't even have to get involved with the Indianapolis Colts. Every game that Andrew Luck starts is cheating for the Indianapolis Colts, considering how they got him, and they tanked an entire fucking season. And if you don't think that they did that, then you still believe in Santa Claus. All right? I'm not even saying my team is fucking in- innocent. Not by any stretch of the fucking means. I don't give a fuck if you say my team cheats, but it's when you get on your high horse and you say that your team doesn't cheat too. That's when I say, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to walk away from this and I'm going to go have myself a water with a lemon because I'm on the wagon. Yeah. Why don't the fucking Ravens and the Colts just own up to the fact that you're just jealous of how long the Patriots have been good and how many fucking Super Bowls we've been to and how many games we fucking won. All right, you cunts. You got yourself two Super Bowls, the Ravens. What's your fucking problem? Indianapolis, I know what that guy's fucking problem is. It's his goddamn personal life. Um, oh, geez. Oh, I, wow, that was a low blow. I did not want to say that. I didn't want to say that, but I'm just sick of this guy trying to fucking, you know, Of course, these cunts don't want Brady to come back. They want the Patriots to be 0-4, so they got a fucking chance at winning. A better fucking chance. Right now, do you think they're really outraged at the Patriots? They're not. This is just part of them. The same way, like, you fucking tank a season to get Andrew Luck. The same way you look the other way on obstruction of justice or a fucking, you know, somebody beating the shit out of somebody in an elevator because you want those players on the fucking field. You don't want Brady on the field. So, of course, you're going to play the outrage card. Of course you're going to do that. When someone else almost beat their fucking girlfriend to death and almost got fucking four games. Not talking about the guy from Baltimore, this latest fucking guy. All right? It's complete fucking horseshit. So anybody out there who's actually buying into this shit, uh, you're just a patriot hater or you believe in Santa Claus. All right? And I'm never going to hear your argument 
because I don't go to sports bars. I think people who actually really think that this is a big deal, the whole fucking deflate gate thing, are the kind of people that even in July are sitting there wearing a, a pro level NFL jersey with somebody else's name on the back and you got wing sauce in your, in your fucking beard stubble. All right? And you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I think it's high time you fucking grow up. What do you think about that? I don't give a fuck if Brady comes back in game six. We're still going to make the playoffs and we're still going to come back and fucking haunt you cunts. All right? And we're going to break your hearts in your own fucking stadium. I don't care how loud you are. All right? Well, if you go there dressed like a bird... You know, or you got a sword in your tooth or you're fucking eating a dog bone. They don't give a fuck. They're professionals. They're going to come in there. And metaphorically speaking, they're going to gut you. All right? So get ready for the heartache. Another football season's coming. (laughs) Oh, I'm talking a bunch of shit. I don't give a fuck. We just won our fourth. I'm a happy fan. Um, Speaking of which, being up in Montreal um, always makes me think of the Expos. And uh, did I ever tell you that time I went to an Expos game by myself? I was uh, doing a gig. I might have done it. It was either a college or I did the Lake Ontario Playhouse um, way back in the day. Um, that's like one of the first headlining lining gigs I got outside of the New England area. And uh, Mike Kinney, I believe, was the guy who booked me up there. He had a great – I always loved doing that gig. But anyways, um, so I was up there up on Lake Ontario, and it was at that point I was trying to go to all the ballparks, so I saw that the Expos had a game the next day, so I said, fuck it. So I got in my rental car by myself, and I'm crossing the Canadian border in a very obscure place. I'm not coming up 95, and I'm by myself, so the fucking security guard up there You know, (laughs) security guard, you're going to another country. Find the security guard because walking up, he's like, uh, he's like, oh, where you going there, eh? And I was sorry. And I was like, "Uh, I'm going to uh, an Expos game. He's like, oh, yeah, you're going up there by yourself. And I was like, yep. And he goes, oh, okay, why don't you pull over there, eh? So I pull over my rental car and I'm like, what the fuck? I never gotten pulled over before and I'm standing there. And him and this other guy proceed to rip my fucking rental car apart. I'm like, what are they doing? And then it finally dawned on me how pa- that they thought that nobody was pathetic enough to drive an extra two and a half hours to go see an afternoon Expos game by themselves. Nobody was that sad of a human being. And it just struck me as funny, and I started fucking laughing. And they were looking over at me, and I had this big smile on my face, and I was laughing because I knew they thought, this guy's got to be dealing drugs. There's no way he's actually going to an Expos game by himself. And um, it pissed them off, and they searched even harder. And then when they just realized I was just laughing at them, uh, I think they took extra time almost trying to make me lose the game. Lose the, I missed the game. So I ended up getting in the car, and I drove up there, and I sat out in the outfield at Olympic Stadium, and I remember they had one armrest on the chairs out there, and for whatever fucking reason, bare bones, it's an Olympic fucking stadium, it's the one that I believe Bruce Jenner, who's now Katie, Caitlin, right, he fucking won the uh, the goddamn decathlon there, and uh, I sat out there and I watched somebody steal home plate, and I jumped up in the fucking air freaking out that I saw somebody steal home plate, um... And nobody in the, the stadium was reacting. So I sat back down thinking I didn't see what I just saw. And then I went home and I watched TSN or whatever the fuck I watched that night. Uh, that's their ESPN up there. And they go, hey, what's up? You don't see that often? And I realized that I had actually seen it and was fucked out of the moment because the people out in the outfield were too busy singing that soccer song. That ole, 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 that bullshit. Um, there's my Montreal story. So anyways... Uh, which always reminds me whenever I think of the Expos is uh, that fucking team that could have been, which was the 1994 Montreal Expos, the one that Pedro Martinez always gets that look in, in his eye when he talks about it, going, oh, man, we were loaded. We were loaded. They were like the best team in baseball. And then the strike came, canceled the rest of the season and the World Series. And I always thought that, Pedro Martinez was on that team with Randy Johnson. 
And I believe I've said that on the podcast, and no one, to my knowledge, has ever corrected me. Um, he wasn't. Randy Johnson, um, Pedro Martinez was 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 part of one of the worst trades of all fucking time. The Dodgers thought he was too brittle, too small to last, and they traded him to Montreal for fucking Jack Squat. And um, so that, that trade is always brought up. But the Randy Johnson trade, the Expos trade to Seattle, whenever they do like the, some, you know, the top 20 worst major league fucking uh, trades of all time, it's never in there. So here's one for you. Here's an obscure one because people always bring up, you know, obviously the biggest one of all time is the Red Sox, you know, selling Babe Ruth. You know, we traded the guy for cash so this guy could fucking could bankroll his wife's Broadway play. Unfucking believable. Unfucking believable. Even unforgivable back then. Because who knew what it was going to become? Baseball and everything. But just fuck that. That is the worst one of all time. But here's one that is, and this fascinates me. Worst trades of all time that nobody bring that nobody really brings up. If you guys like to tweet me some, I'll read read some on Thursday. Um, or if you want to email me, I'll I'll get the thing here. What is it? Uh, the email is what the fuck is it? Bill at the mm podcast.com. Bill at the mm podcast.com. So Expos traded Randy Johnson. He played for them in 1988 and, and looked promising. And then he started off 1989 really poorly. He went he started off 0 and 4. And his ERA was a little bit high, and they just I don't know, they must have thought he was a flash in the pan. So listen to this. When the Mariners traded the Mariners traded Oh, let, 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 I should say the Expos traded Randy Johnson to the Mariners for Mark Langston and Mike Campbell. All right. And the, Seattle got Randy Johnson and then Gene Harris, Brian Holman. Uh, I believe that that was the trade. And virtually all these Seattle players were unhappy. Here's some, here's some of the quotes. Third baseman Jim Presley said, so this is actually, I guess, exonerates the, the, the Expos. Because if other pro baseball players were like, what the fuck did we do? I guess it's not that bad. But third baseman Jim Presley said, this is a sad day for Mariner baseball. In four months now, we've lost two of the best pitchers in Mariner's history. Because uh, they just traded Langston and Mike Moore, who signed with Oakland. And the other signed as a free agent. And he's going, yeah, this is a sad day. I don't know what went on, whether they made him an offer or to him or whether he wanted out of here. But maybe they should have been thinking of how we're supposed to replace him. Second baseman, Harold Reynolds. Harold Reynolds, who's one of my favorite baseball people of all time. He just knows so much. He, this is him as a young man said, this crushes me, and the reality of it all won't hit me until we take the field tomorrow in Milwaukee and Mike Langston won't be there. Ah, in defense of him, that kind of seems like he was buddies with him. But uh, catcher Dave Valley just said, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me now to my own Boston Bruins. And we had made some very, to put it mildly, aggressive fucking moves here in the offseason. Um, we obviously traded Milan Lucic to the, Ch the Kings in exchange, in exchange for the 13th overall pick. And backup goaltender Martin Jones and defenseman prospect... Colin Miller. Now, I really hope in the future, as I read these names, that these some some somebody pan the fuck out. Um, so here, okay, with the flurry of trades and draft picks, Bruins GM Don Sweeney began a roster makeover. He really did. So here's what we ended up getting. We tr we also traded. Obviously, we got rid of Dougie Hamilton. So here here's what we got with our picks. And I'm hoping someday in the future, in the fucking future, somebody's gonna listen to this. And say that this was a great move because, um, you know, back in the day when we traded, uh, what's his face? Uh, I always forget his fucking name. The hell's his goddamn name? The guy that we traded, he wouldn't go into the corners, but he sco scored all the goals. We traded him to Toronto. The only guy I've seen in the NHL who had, he he looks he has like a pickup hockey face. He looks like he's accounting during the week. You know what I mean? He's the only guy I've seen with a fat face. How are you fat playing hockey? 
That's one thing I tell you. There's no fat fucking hockey players. Not none whatsoever. But somehow this guy is fucking fat. Ah, Jesus Christ. Hang on a second. What the fuck is this goddamn name? Let me look this up here. Dougie Hamilton. Hamilton fucking trade. There we go. There we go. Bruins hurt themselves. Bruins trade Dougie Hamilton for draft picks to the fucking Flames. Jesus Christ. What the? So anyways, what is the guy's name? I'm sorry, everybody right now. Phil Kessel. All right. So back in the day, we traded Phil Kessel to the Toronto Maple Leafs in 2009 for a pair of first round draft picks that later we later used to select Tyler Sagan and Dougie Hamilton. And it was expected, according to this article, that those two players would be cornerstones of the organization, at least for the next decade. And by the way, we ended up winning the Stanley Cup with those two guys. So now we're doing it again. We're trading again. We're kind of like the mini Blackhawks. We don't win as many. We've only made, we've made big fucking moves, but we've only won one. So I'm, I'm actually willing to give Sweeney the benefit of the doubt. Well, who's, who's kidding who? This is all I fucking got. What else am I going to do? Um, so here, here's, a, here's all the draft picks that we got. First round draft pick, number 13. The Boston Bruins select defenseman. I can't even say the guy's name. Jacob Zabor- Zaboral, 18, was third among rookie defensemen. Quebec, I don't give a fuck how big he is. is he? 13 goals, 20 assists last season. Then we picked this kid, number 14. We had back-to-back picks. We picked a fucking sniper. Jake DeBrusque, 18. Six feet tall, 174 pounds. Jesus Christ. I'd love to be 174 pounds. I'm sorry. Forward <laughs> led the Western Hockey League Swift League Swift Current in scoring with 42 goals and 39 assists. Nice and even. Spreading it around. Stick it in the back of the fucking net. Number 15, we selected, this is the guy I like, it's just as far as sight, Zachary Senishin. I don't even want to say his fucking name, Senishin. 18, spent last season, uh, blah, 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 blah. Wait, wait a minute, where's the fucking, there's somebody here who's like 6'5". Here he is. This is a guy I got hope for. Number 37, defenseman Brandon Carlo, 18. The 6'5", 196 found. 196-pound defenseman, had four goals, 21 assists. Sounds like he's a stay-at-home guy. You know? I don't know. I'm hoping somebody fucking pans out. That's what we got. So I'm actually kind of excited now. We're really young. Fuck it. Sweeney clean house. What am I going to do? Be that guy who bitch moans and complains. So hopefully some of those mean somebody something to somebody someday, right? And you guys can actually laugh that I mispronounced all of the fucking names. You know, hopefully I just mispronounced the next fucking Wayne Gretzky. Um, but anyways, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard seeing that fucking no Lucic, no Dougie Hamilton. Dougie Hamilton was in the prime of his fucking career. I still think that was a fucking crazy move. Why do you do that? This guy's a proven guy. Well, you know, he's probably going to want a lot of money. Well, he fucking deserves it. Pay him. All right, I'm done. I'm done with that shit. Let's get back to the fucking podcast here. Let's get to some of the questions here. All right. Uh, Okay. Romanian fan. Funny you should say that. Ash was actually talking to my uh, agent today about uh, doing an Eastern European tour. I was thinking of doing two European tours next year where I do the uh, the usual guys, Iceland over to England. And then next and then later I do fucking Scandinavia and then down the fucking uh, Baltic states there. Um, Hi, Bill. My name is Eddie. I'm a 30-year-old Romanian living in the UK. I'm 6'1 and used to be 290 pounds and in January decided to become serious and lose weight. Uh, I got to a lowest of 217, but two months ago I started working as a truck driver and I'm starting to gain the weight back. I used, uh, I used to work in a warehouse, very physical job, and also quit smoking four months ago. I listen to your podcast. I'm a big fan. Uh, you are a great comedian. I only wrote to you because I absolutely love your way and share all your political views. Dude, please put some punctuation in this. I know you mentioned my country a few podcasts ago when you were in Paris and your lovely wife, whom I salute kindly. <laughs> I love how people learn English. It's so proper. I salute kindly. Well, I salute you too kindly. 
And I want you to know that we Romanians are damned to be born in the same country with those pests that are called gypsies. They ruined our name and country. But I 100% agree with the fact that you did a heads up for your future holiday makers in Paris. And second of all, I'm a trucker. And a few podcasts ago, you were were wondering if truckers are listening to you. Uh, Well, my good man, at least one surely does. The point of the email is, do I continue to do this job that I fucking love being a trucker? but probably going to gonna fuck all my hard work, hard work of losing weight. Or do you have a piece of advice? Thank you so very much. Yeah, dude, start eating healthy. Start eating healthy. What I would do is I would go to the grocery store. I'd have a fucking cooler. And uh, for breakfast, I'd have like an apple or an orange. I would make sure that I eat really light. And at night, I would try to get on the fucking treadmill. But you have to eat perfectly. And um, you have to learn way more about nutrition than I do. But if you love being a trucker, man, just you got to you got to have a job you love because then it doesn't feel like work. But if you're starting to put the weight on, um, you know, I would definitely say don't eat after five. And I would have a giant fucking salad with some protein every night for dinner. Get yourself a sandwich. I'd crush the fucking waters, you know, um, Late night snack, I do the celery with a spoonful of peanut butter, and that gets me through. Now, I've never tried to be a trucker. That is fucking brutal. The closest thing I've ever been to a trucker as far as is uh, difficult to, to, to stay in shape was sitting in a writer's room. When I sat in the writer's room at F is for Family, I put on some weight. Then that went into the holidays, which went into the world tour. Not world tour. I went on the other side of the world. And then... Uh, you know, these bus tours haven't fucking helped. So um, what I would do is i just get on the scale, see what you weigh, and then next week try to just weigh lighter. That's it. Even if it's just a pound because you can't fucking work out as much, I would definitely try to be as active as you possibly can. You know what I would do? I'd come up. This is what I'd do if I was you. I'd come up with the fucking trucker workout and diet. You know, write a book. Figure out what works for you. Then turn it into a goddamn book. And then they'll expand it, not just the trucker diet. Just say, hey, this worked for a guy driving a truck. Imagine what it would do for you. All you do is commute. They'd, they'd sell the shit out of it. And then maybe you got enough money to buy your own truck or start your own trucking company. Who knows? I'll tell you right now, you have a hit book. Even after they're done stealing from you, you at least have time to go to the gym. All right. Well, thank you for listening. And uh, um, I don't know. I'll go to Romania someday with my pocket zipped shut. Uh, girlfriend's parents. Hey, Bill, I am in eighth grade, and I am about to date this girl who is a freshman in high school. Dude, you're fucking crushing it, unless you're a woman. Then, hey, go easy. (laughs) Yes, there is a double standard. Your mother would say the same thing. Uh, The only problem is that her parents don't want her to date me because they think she'll get bullied for dating a person in a lower grade from her. Oh, all right. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, I definitely don't want to leave the relationship for some bullshit reason. So I'm asking you and hopefully the lovely Nia, too, for your guy's advice on what I should do. Thanks and go fuck yourself. Wait, the only problem is her parents don't want her to date me. Well, I mean, you really don't have a choice here. I mean, you your only choice is I want to keep dating you. It, it's This is the ball is in her court and is in, uh, in her court. So I would just say to her, say, listen, I really like you. And I want to. uh I want to be with you. I'd like to date you. Okay. Um, if you feel the same way, I'd hope you'd, you'd want to keep dating me. But uh, I can't make you date me. So, uh, you know, that's it. I'm going all in. World Series of Poker. I pushed all my chips in. You still want to be with me? I'll be down the fucking arcade tonight at 8 o'clock, whatever you kids do nowadays. I'll be staring like a zombie at my fucking PlayStation flat screen and the surround sound. Um I don't know. What do you? Uh, I don't. What, what? 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 What more can you do other than tell her that you want to be with her? You know, that's what I would do. But uh, no matter what, end on a good fucking note. If she can't do it, just just play this card at your fucking age. Just be like, you know what? I understand. He might even add this in there. Listen, I understand. I don't want to put you in a bad position with your parents, but I do really like you. And I would like to still be with you. And that isn't bullshit, right? 
But the parent part is setting you up for the future because next year you're going to be a freshman provided you study and don't fuck up and be held back. All right? Don't be that guy with the mustache in eighth grade, please. All right. Then you get to fucking high school. Now you're in high school. You know, it's not as bad. Sophomore, freshman, who gives it? Nobody's going to give a fuck. You're going to the same school. You're laying the groundwork to still be in the ball game. You know what I mean? You're at bat right now. The emergency swing right now. Stay alive. Stay alive. That's what I would say. Stay alive in the batter's box. Just say, listen, I know it's got to be tough that your parents are giving you a rough time, okay? And ultimately, the decision's going to be yours, but I still want to date you because I really like you, all right? But uh, I don't want to make you miserable either. So make, you know, God damn it, I went one sentence too far. I was going to say make a decision that you're comfortable with. Don't say that. Say what the fuck I just said and leave off that last thing. All right? And then that's it. And if she fucking lets you go, like I say, stay on good fucking terms uh, with her. Do not stalk her on Facebook. Do not pay attention if she starts dating somebody else. Listen, if she decides to walk, you just said to be like, all right, well, maybe next year when I'm in high school. All right? Maybe then? And she'll say, yeah, maybe then. And say, all right. And just say, listen, I'm not going to get mad if you start dating somebody else or something like that, and then you fucking get it out there, and then you can fucking crush it in eighth grade. You're in there, dude. You're already, you're already taking down them in ninth grade. This is like you're going from majors down to fucking college ball. You know? Hanging curveballs all day long, sending them into the fucking trees like the thrill ride. Remember that one of the first thrill ride fucking video I sent you? No? All right. All right, Bill, I'm an old girlfriend. My old girl, I'm old. Girlfriend wants baby. Uh, hey, Billy, I'm about to turn 48, and I'm dating a great girl, and she's just turned 34. Lucky me. I was previously married for 26 years and never had children. She has no baggage whatsoever, no kids, no ex, loser husband, etc. Uh, she said she would like to have at least one kid, and I think she feels time is running out. I kind of think I am, I'm too old, but I don't want to lose her. I like kids, but they seem like a lot of work. <laughs> I don't know, those kids, you know, they seem like a lot of work. Said, seem like a lot of work, even if completely healthy. Jesus Christ, dude. Even more if they have any issues. Jesus, dude. I can, you know, you're one of those guys that shouldn't have had kids. Not sure I got the energy for that. I want to travel and go to shows and drink and continue to be selfish. But in some way, it sounds kind of cool. Please help. Maybe Nia has a take. Uh, P.S. Stuart Copeland is the greatest drummer of all time. Capital, and you know it's true. Uh, yeah, he's one of the greats. And if that's your greatest drum of all time, I, I wouldn't argue that, you know, to each his own. Um, hey, dude, if you want to do it, go ahead and do it. I don't think you're too old, you know. And I think it's really, like, as far as, like, the work, it's it's the first, I think, three, four years. Once they get around five and they kind of know right from wrong, then you kind of got a buddy. He's still going to be a pain in the ass. But, you know, he's going to the bathroom himself, you know, or herself or whatever. They kind of know right from wrong. And then they think you're a god. So, like, the next fucking seven years, even though they're still going to throw temper tantrums and shit, by the time they're seven or eight, I mean, you, if you did the fucking job and you raised them right, you got to have a pretty cool kid. And then, uh, you know. Enjoy the next five years, because then once they become teenagers, they think they fucking know everything and just pray to God they don't get knocked up or knock somebody up or get addicted to drugs. It's really once they turn 13, you're just trying to get them through education, getting a good job and not marrying a fucking psycho. And if you do that, then I think then you can finally fucking breathe a little bit. That's what it seems like. But um, yeah, it's a lot of work, but there's a part of you that I think wants to do it. So if you want to do it, I would say do it now. It's now or never. All right, X lady called me up. <laughs> hey, Billy, bitch tits. Hey, easy. Jesus Christ. I hope you're meeting your weight loss goals. I love listening to your podcast at the gym. Yada, 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 yada. Go fuck yourself. Uh, oh, speaking of drumming, by the way, I did the goddamn comedy jam three times last week. I got to play out live in a club, man. What a fucking, what a thrill that is. What a fucking thrill. You know, I want to thank Josh Adam Myers and everybody uh, in the band, Joel, Jay, and Nick, for putting up with me and my awful fucking playing. 
Um, I was actually totally relaxed the whole week when I was playing. You know, I fucked up a lot, but uh, I just kept going. I didn't drop time too much, you know. I don't think I, you know, I fucked up Phil's. There's a couple, you know, double hits on the bass drum that I like sounded like mud. But whatever. Snare was right there on the two and four. Nobody noticed. Um, but what a fucking great time that is. I can't imagine traveling with three other people and being in a band and being fucking broke. But I, I can tell you right now, sitting behind a set of drums, you know, best seat in the fucking house, watching everybody else in the band going fucking nuts and actually seeing people like into it is, is one of the fucking coolest things I've ever got to do. So uh, I'll be doing a lot more of those in the future. Why the fuck not? They're fun as hell. Anyways, I love listening to your podcast at the gym. Yada, yada, yada. Go fuck yourself. I need some advice about this ex lady. I used to date a few years back at the end of college. She recently sent me a message wanting to hang out. I asked her about her situation, her situation from a friend. The lady is moving in in seven weeks and, uh, and quit her job. Wait a minute. I just started daydreaming halfway through that. I was thinking about drumming. Isn't that weird? You can actually do that while somebody else keeps reading and talking. All right, I need some advice about this. Actually, I used to date a few years back. She recently sent me a message wanting to hang out. Asked what a situ- situation friend. The lady is m- moving in seven, seven weeks and quit her job. I figured she was looking for a quick fling before she left. Ah, Bill, I thought I had struck gold. I really did. One and a half months of no strings attached fun, and then she would just be fucking gone. You idiot. You probably saw her too much, and now she thinks there's a reason to stay. Never have to see her again. Anyways, I agree to hang out with her, and that's when she tells me that she is homeless. Oh, Jesus Christ. She's homeless. How the fuck is she calling you? She fucked up her lease and is out seven weeks before she leaves. So now I'm hanging out with her in one week. My question for you, parentheses, and maybe your wife, could help uh, add some female charm to the answer. How do I bang her? Oh, my God. But not have to let her live with me for two months. You know what? I got to put down the mic for half a second and just applaud you for admitting to the exact selfish piece of shit thing that you want to do. Hang on a second. <laughs> got to love honesty, even if you don't like the, the what somebody wants to do. I think she... I should probably just go for it and worry about that situation later. What do you think? Thank you, and please go fuck yourself, a redheaded dope like yourself. All right. My freckles and arms here. Um, all right. How do I bang her but not have to live with her? Oh, simple. You just put her up in a motel, and you say you're going to pay for it. That's what I would do. That's fucking filthy, man. Jesus Christ. Put her up in a fucking hotel. It'll be cheap. She's not fucking homeless. She'll feel obligated to bang you. You were already banging before. It won't feel so filthy. That's what you could do. I might need a shower after this fucking answer, but that I would just say that that's the way to go. Uh, by no means let her ever stay over at your house. Do not ever fuck her over at your house. Fuck her at the motel that you put her up in. That's what you need to do. Okay? She cannot come over your fucking house. If she asks you why, just say, just be honest. Just be honest. Just say, because I'm not, you know what, dude? Um, this is really fucked up. She's calling you in a time of need. She's calling you because she's homeless. Lady is moving in seven weeks and quit her job. Oh, dude, she might be on drugs. She fucked up her lease. She's moving. Ah, I don't know, dude. I don't know, man. You might be fucking a somebody who's uh, using needles here, man. You know what I say, dude? I got one for you. Why don't you fucking rub one out and then think about it? Oh, he says, P.S. When is your next special coming out? I think I speak for everyone when I say I can't wait to see it. Well, that's very nice of you. Um, well, I put them out every two years. So I came out. The last one came out in December. Every little more than two years. So this is my year off where I just get to fuck around and have a great time, which I'm doing. And um, I'm already, you know, I have some ideas about where I want to shoot my next one, what I want it to look like, and I'm just waiting for the material to come. But uh, 
I'm really, I'm really happy. I'll tell you, I'm real. I'll, I'll tell you, I'm really happy with where my act was this past weekend when I was up in Montreal. Uh, all right, let me read the rest of this, the rest of the uh, advertising here, and then I got a dilemma and a couple of overrated, underrated. Remember those? All right, all right. Dilemma: Would you rather do a show with no swearing or take a bath with Oprah, also with no swearing? Um, I wouldn't subject Oprah to taking a bath with me. I'd do a show not swearing. I've done that. I can do that. Um, underrated, overrated. These are for me. Underrated. Calling in a night. That's what I learned when I was in Montreal. When I wasn't drinking and I was just sitting there slamming waters and everything, it got to that fucking point. Like, you know what? There's a point where you saw everything that's going to happen. Everything else is just going to get messy. Get home now where you can still wake up early and fucking work out. Uh, also underrated, drinking waters while everyone else is getting fucked up. It's tremendous. It's tremendous. Everybody starts slurring. They say crazy shit to you. And right as they're getting just completely not even tolerable, you just fucking walk out and they don't even notice. Um, also underrated, working out in the morning. Stepping on the scale after pushing a buck ninety a month ago and seeing 180 one eight zero point zero. All right, overrated. After parties, rich food, and buying new shit. You buy new shit, and then that gets with your old shit. Next thing you know, your fucking room is filled. It's filled up. You know what I mean? You got to get underrated. Getting rid of shit. I got stuff in my garage. I have old DVDs. Would you guys still buy DVDs if I put them up on my website? I'll autograph all of them just to get them out of my garage. I'm going to do it. I think there's a few older people out there listening to the podcast that are old school like me, and they want, you know, they want the gold behind their money. They don't want to digitally own it. They want to have the hard copy. Um, all right, that's going to be the podcast for this week. Uh, what a week I had, man. Montreal, Ottawa, you guys were unbelievable. Such great fans up there. Uh, the goddamn Comedy Jam. Josh, Joel, Jay, and Nick, thank you guys for putting up with my drumming, and uh, thank you to everybody that came out to my shows. Um, what else? What else? Who else did I want to thank? God damn it. I can't fucking remember. Anyways, <laughs> I'm the worst. I got to stay. You know, I did all right this week. I actually made some lists. Anyways, this is going to take me forever to upload because my internet sucks. So I got an hour and 10 minutes here. You guys have a good weekend on Thursday. I'll check in on you there. All right, go fuck yourselves. I'll talk to you later.